All right, friends, welcome back. This is the epic story, and this is lesson three. We're going to talk about the role of Christ today. Very excited. This is an important lesson. Now, why is it so important that we get the epic story of Scripture correct? Well, very simply, however you understand the epic story is going to be a chain reaction that's going to set up how you understand and how you live the Christian life. Uh, my personal thesis, opinion, very strong conviction is that much of the mediocre, uh, mediocre Christian living we see today, or, or just or just the narrow scope, the unbiblical living uh, today, it can be traced back to a misunderstanding of the gospel, misunderstanding of the narrative of Scripture that begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and made us in his image to rule. Now, there are five parts to this story. The first is God gives, uh, God gives mankind dominion. Second is the fall. The third is the role of Christ. The fourth is the role of mankind, that's the Christian life, and then lastly, our eternal destiny. And friends, when you understand this story, it really changes everything, so I'm very excited that you're going through this. Okay, so we've already spoken of God giving us dominion, which is Genesis 1, and again in Psalm 8, 5, and 6, and all throughout Scripture, you see God who's able, I mean, He is the all-powerful, all-knowing, e- eternal Godhead. And he is able to do whatever he wants to do. He could have he could have gotten his children from Egypt to the promised land with without a snap of his fingers. I mean, it could just happen. He could do all of these things, but he chooses to work with us. Why? Because that's his good pleasure, and that's why he gave us that edict that he made us in his image, and we are to have dominion. So we talked about the fact that we're made in God's image to rule. That's a big deal. If you haven't watched that lesson, stop now, go back, and start from the beginning. In the last lesson, we talked about the fall. And we talked about the five things that went wrong. Uh, We died physically, we died spiritually, we died eternally. Creation was cursed, and Satan became the god of this age. And I want to start by asking the question, why does it matter? Well, today, let's go ahead and jump into the teaching of Christ. And this this is the question and answer, and you're going to see how this is tied to what we talked about with the fall. Um, The question is this, what is the role of Jesus? Simple question, you get various answers. What is the role of Jesus? What what was and still is the mission of Christ? And here is the answer. The answer is, his mission is to fix everything that went wrong. Now, that answer assumes you know what. Question is, what is the role of Christ? And the answer is to fix everything that that went wrong. Well, that answer assumes that you know what went wrong, what we lost in the fall. And what we're gonna see today is that all five of those things uh, us dying physically, spiritually, eternally, Satan becoming the God of this age, cre- uh, creation being cursed, Jesus fixes all of that. He has either fixed it, or he is in the process of fixing it, or he's going to come back someday and fix it. And so, once again, when we get this right at the beginning, we had dominion, we lost the ability to have dominion and to glorify God. Jesus came to restore that. Uh, and just to make the point, what is often substituted for this full vision of the epic story is that Jesus came back just so we could go to heaven. Friends, don't misunderstand me. I'm so glad that if I die today by the grace of God, even though I don't deserve it, I'm going to heaven instead of eternal hell. That's huge. It's awesome. I'm not making light of it, but friends, that is not God's ultimate goal or plan. Jesus didn't come here, as we're going to see today, going around trying to get people to go to heaven when they died. He instead tried to get people to enter into the abundant Christian life today, knowing that, guess what? If you enter into that life today, if you follow Christ, going to heaven is going to take care of itself. Okay, so as we look at the role of Christ, the best way I have personally found to teach it is to break up the ministry of Christ into a past role, a present role, and a future role. Now, to be fair, the past role could go back to Genesis 1-1 because Jesus was there in the beginning, creating the heavens and the earth. But we're going to, just for the sake of this lesson, we're going to do past role of his incarnate state. So as you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word uh, the word was with God, the Word was God, and then John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. So that's where we're going to begin today. So what was his past mission 2,000 years ago? What has his mission been since the ascension up till now and in the future? And what is his mission going to be when he comes back? And this is really, really incredible stuff. Okay, so let's start with his past role. The past role of Jesus, simply defined, was to rescue us spiritually from the kingdom of darkness and to usher in his kingdom right now, spiritually speaking, on this earth. And a a really great verse that summarizes 
the uh, ministry of Christ is Matthew 4, 23, and it says this. It says, And he, Jesus, went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction among the people. So Jesus went around proclaiming or preaching, teaching, and healing. And each of these are very, very significant. Let's talk first about proclaiming. What was Jesus proclaiming? Simply put, he was proclaiming the availability of, of the kingdom of God. Check this out. What good is it for the Son of God to come down and die for the world if the world doesn't know it's available to them? Right? I mean, he could have just come down, no one watching, hired some guys, you know, been crucified, his blood would have been shed, and then he could have, you know, knocked them over the head and ascended up to heaven, and he would have paid for the sins of the world. But if we don't know what's available to us, what's the point? It's kind of like ransoming someone out of prison and they can open the gate and walk out, but they don't know it, so they stay locked up. We see this in Mark 1.15 where Christ says, The time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. We see it in John 10.10, 10, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come so you can have life and have it to the full. Uh, we see it in John 10.12. I believe it's 10.12. No, it's 8.12. John 8.12, where Christ said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Each of these verses are speaking of life not after death, but life today. So once again, Christ, Christ was preaching that you don't have to wait until you die to enter into kingdom living. That life begins today. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, once again, how can we enter into it if we don't know it's available? But also it helps us to find the Christian life. Once again, God is not trying to get people to go to heaven. He's trying to get people to follow him and mirror or reproduce or birth his light, be a conduit for his light on this earth. I mean, he said to us, you are the light of the world. And we like to put that back on him, but then he puts it back on us. He says, no, no, you are. Yes, he is also, but he says, you are the light of the world. And so my challenge to you is, I'm guessing if you're a follower of Christ, you would say that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was absolutely necessary. It had to happen. Well, my challenge to you is, would you also say that the preaching of Christ had to happen? Most people will be like, ah, oh, no, it's kind of lesser. Well, guess what you end up then? You end up with people who believe in the death, the burial, and resurrection, but they're ignorant about the preaching. Friends, what I'm going to try and convince you today is that Jesus' three years of ministry before the cross wasn't just a cute prelude to the real work of the cross. Those three years of ministry were just as important because, once again, his mission isn't just to die for us. His mission was to set us free right now. Okay, so he proclaimed. He also taught. What was his teaching all about? Well, I would suggest this, that Jesus was teaching us how to practically live in God's kingdom. See, the teachings of Christ aren't just cute sayings to put on the wall. The teachings of Christ are life. They are gold. Once again, what good is it to pay for the sins of the world? Well, and, 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 and let's say you preach. Let's say, hey, you can be set free. But then what good is it to set people free but not teach them how to walk in that freedom? It's like opening a prison cell but not teaching the guilty convict how to now live as a free man. We see this with people in prison, right? They get out and they... They haven't learned how to live properly, so they end up going back in. Well, Christ doesn't want us to just come out of the prison and live like we're still in the prison. He wants us to live like freemen. And so he teaches us. He teaches us the Sermon on the Mount. What I love about the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, all of Christ's teaching, both the red letters and the black letters, are huge and wonderful and beautiful. There are 613 commandments in the Old, many of which point to Christ. Many people don't know this. There's 1,050 commandments in the New. We have a, lift, uh, a list of those at the end of our obedience book in our Dio trilogy. But what I love about the Sermon on the Mount is at the end of that, he says this. He says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. And, you know, the storms come and it stands. But anyone who hears these words and doesn't put them into practice, well, his house is built on the sand. Storms come and, it, and it's destroyed. And, friends, what's so amazing about that is he's speaking that after a 30-minute sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, just, just those chapters have enough teaching and truth in life where we can have a victorious Christian experience. Christ says, come to me, all who are la uh, labor. I'm sorry. Christ says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. He says, learn from me. So let me challenge you. You would say that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was absolutely necessary. Would you also say that the teaching of Christ was absolutely necessary? You say, well, no, maybe it's down here. Well, what's the big deal? Well, if it's down here, then guess what you get? You get Christians that believe Jesus died for them, but they don't believe that his teaching is just as important. Tell me if this sounds kind of familiar. You have, you have Christians who believe in Christ, but they don't apply his teaching. However you view the ministry and mission of Christ dictates, determines your view of the Christian life. And when you understand that the ministry of Christ was death, burial, resurrection, and also proclaiming teaching and ministry and healing, you get a full scope of the Christian life. So, we, so we've talked about proclaiming or preaching. We've talked about teaching. Let's talk about ministry or healing. What's the point that we need to understand with healing? Well, it's that Jesus didn't just speak about freedom. He set people free. Now, I'm not talking primarily about physical healing, even though God can definitely do that. I don't believe that God doesn't heal today. I believe he does, but I also am not on the other extreme where I believe he wants all of us healed all the time. I personally don't believe that. He is going to ultimately heal us all when we're glorified. And yet, listen to the words of Christ in Luke 4. This is one of my favorite scenes in the Gospels where Christ goes into the synagogue in his hometown. They hand him the scroll. He opens it up, and this is what he reads. The Spirit of the the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Okay, we would all agree with that. Yeah, good news, the gospel, but it goes on. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, proclaiming sight to the blind and and, and, uh, setting at liberty those who are oppressed, Jesus did physical healing that applied But that was, in my opinion, all a type and shadow of the inner healing he wants all of us to have. Because guess what? I have eyes that work right here, but before I came to Christ, I was spiritually blind. I was spiritually crippled. I was spiritually deaf. I was spiritually mute. And and, and so, you know, physical healing, that's there and it's available. And sometimes God's will is that he always wants his children to be spiritually eyes open, able to speak, able to hear, able to walk able to run. And so Christ didn't just speak about freedom. He wants us to be set free. So this is just as important. Once again, people say, well, why is that a big deal? This is why, because if you don't believe that Jesus wants to set us spiritually free from captivity, then you have Christians and tell me if this sounds familiar. You have Christians who have been going to church for 30 years. That's great. But they're still struggling with the same things they did uh, 30 years before. And their idea of the Christian life is let's just bunker down and survive and wait until we die so we can finally be set free. Friends, that is not the message that Christ preached. Christ preached one of freedom today. He says, I have come to proclaim liberty for the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, uh, to set those at liberty who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the ministry of Christ. So death, burial, resurrection, absolutely. Proclaiming, teaching, ministry, just as much. Friends, when you understand that, you understand the Christian life. Now, let's talk about, hey, we're still in his past role, so hold on. But let's really quick talk about the cross, because this is what we need to talk about the least, because this is what we talk about all the time. Um, I mean, almost every Christian, of course, knows about the cross, uh, and and the cross, how the cross was absolutely necessary. And the challenge I want to give you is this. What was the focus of Christ on the cross? Was it, oh, you know, this is hard, but it's necessary so that Jared can go to heaven? Well, obviously, once again, heaven and the new earth to come, that's all a part of it. But what I want to suggest to you is the heart of Christ on the cross, obviously the main goal was satisfying and appeasing his father and the wrath. Um, He did it primarily for his father. But he did it so that we could be set free today. So when you think about the cross, when you think about the resurrection, Think about the heart of God being, he did that so that I can experience eternal life right now, today. So that's the past role of Christ, and it set me free. Instead of spiritual death, I have spiritual life. Instead of eternal death, I have eternal life. And in some sense, Satan's kingdom, the keys were taken back, and he started the process of Satan's destruction. 
The kingdoms of these world have become the kingdoms of Christ, and he will reign, right? Okay, so that's his past role. Let's talk about the present role. What is Jesus doing now? Well, there's two things. He's interceding for the saints, which is a big deal. Study that out. It's a really big deal. And he's also leading a military campaign against the forces of darkness. People often see Christ as very active when he was on this earth physically, and now he's just kind of kicked back. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's just relaxing. No, back then he was involved in the lives of hundreds and thousands. Now he's involved in the lives of hundreds of millions. He is orchestrating the sovereign affairs of his church in this world. He is advancing his kingdom, and it's beautiful and it's awesome. So, so once again, as soldiers of Christ, we need to look at him and not, and not wrongly see him as just sitting on the hammocks of God's shoreline, relax, because if that's how we see our captain, then we're going to put down our weapons and relax as well. And this is this is this is this hyper hyper idea in Christianity of well, the work is done, so I'm done, and we're all done, so let's just sit around and be done. No, Christ did say it is finished. This is a really important point. There are two it is finished in the Bible. One of them is on the cross, to tell us die. It is finished. It is paid in full. That is not in reference to the battle against Satan. That is in reference to the payment for sins. There's another it is finished in Revelation 21.6. Now that one is in the context of the battle. The battle is still raging today. You and I need to get in the game. We have the victory, but we need to fight. And Christ is leading. I mean, when you rightly see that your commander in chief is charging the front lines, advancing, knocking down the gates of hell, then you and I pick up our armor and we go after him. So we have the past role of Christ, present role of Christ. Let's end with the future role of Christ. This is so beautiful. This is so awesome. Okay, well, what is the future role of Christ? Simply put, it is, and this is a quote of scripture, it is to deliver the kingdom to God the Father. The future role of Christ is to deliver the kingdom to God the Father. So this is a quote of 1 Corinthians 15. I think it's 24, 25. It says this, Then comes the end when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after he, after he's destroyed all authority, for he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So it's this picture of the church of God advancing, the church of God making, you know, discipling the nations, the church of God bringing all things into dominion, and then Jesus delivering to the Father, kneeling down, and we'll all be kneeling behind him, and he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. God commissioned his son. I had a kingdom on this earth. It was crippled. It was tainted. I want it back. And he's working with humans. God becomes human in the second person of the Trinity, and Jesus comes. He is still working. One day he's going to return, and this is what he's going to do. He's going to clean house, and he's going to offer the kingdom to God the Father. Now, there's three things that happens, and it should be pretty easy because it's the three things left to be fixed. He's given us spiritual life. He's given us eternal life. But guess what? We don't have physical eternal life yet. So one thing he's going to do is he's going to give us new bodies. And this is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 23. And that is where it speaks of uh, Christ is the first fruit, speaking of the resurrection of the dead. What does that mean that Christ is the first fruits? It means that when Jesus walked out of that tomb, he in essence said to all of creation, this is what's coming. So, so let's say Christ was six feet tall. There's six foot of glorified, redeemed flesh out there somewhere. All the rest of creation is cursed, but not the body of Christ. And when he comes back, according to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, when he returns those who belong to him, we get our new bodies. Second thing he's going to do is he is going to fully destroy uh, Satan's kingdom, which he speaks of here in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Uh, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Uh, it's also spoken of in Revelation 20, verse 10, where it says that he is going to crush the head of Satan. Well, actually, that's prophesied in Genesis 3, 15, but uh, in Revelation 20, where Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. And then he goes and he judges and all of his followers, everyone whose name isn't found in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life, everyone in, in a Hades, all of them are going to be emptied into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So he's going to give us new bodies. He's going to destroy Satan and all of his followers. Evil is going to be extinguished. And then what's next? Well, if you're reading this story for the first time after Revelation 20, the last verse, you'd say, 
I think it's time for a new earth. And guess what <laughs> Revelation 21 1 is? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And heaven, or the new Jerusalem, comes out of heaven, and we reign with Christ forever and ever. Okay, so friends, this is the past, present, future role of Christ. Once again, why is this so important? Because it's the chain reaction that leads to the Christian life. This is what we had in the beginning, dominion with Christ. We lost it. We died physically, spiritually, eternally. Satan became the goddess age. Creation was cursed. Christ comes past, present, and future to fix that. In the next lesson, we're going to get to the Christian life. And now you're set up to see what all it entails. Powerful teaching, friends. Please go over this. Check out the scriptures in detail. Pray over it. Share it with friends, pastors, uh, so that we can better, un better understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. Blessings to you. Please subscribe to our channel. Pass this around. Hit the like button. Comment. Questions and comments below. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.